Okay, good, let's get started. So, I'm Jeff Coleman, and I'm one of the elders here at Caversham Community Church. If you're a visitor, a welcome. Uh, it's lovely to have you. We are embarking on an apologetic series over the summer. Um, so that's what we're going to uh, start this, this Sunday. Um, it's called Soundbite, and it's, it's sub-headline, Getting Across the Christian Message in a Soundbite World. In New Zealand, um, the, you see the percentages of Christians and uh, no religion. And what do you notice about the trend there? You see that between 2006 and 2018, you see a significant change in how people identify themselves, whether Christian or not religious. So not religious went from 31% of uh, New Zealand's population to 49%. This is, this is just in 12 years. So this, is, this is the reality of the, the, the culture that we're living in. When asked, why don't you, why do you not subscribe to a religion? The number one answer by far was that they prefer a scientific and evidence-based approach to life. In other words, if you believe in science and evidence, you won't be religious. That's kind of the connotation. But the Bible, the Christian worldview, in the first sentence of the Bible says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. So what do we do? We know that God's existence is at the very foundation of our whole way of viewing the world. Paul said, since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, has been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So Paul argues that the evidence for God's existence is clear to all. So what's going on? Why is there a disconnect? Well, that's what we're going to address in, over these next few weeks. Most people's um, attention span today is very, very short. We live in a world of commercials and YouTube and, 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 and headlines and the latest gossip, and it's all kind of hit and miss. There's no grand narrative. There's no worldview to, to a grid to filter all of this information. We live in the information age, and there's so much information. We don't really try to piece it all together into a, into a composite whole because it's coming at us so quickly. And so we're competing the gospel message. We're trying to get the gospel message to, to people that are living in a world of this constant barrage. So how do we get our message across? Well, we've got to be ready and equipped to make our case very quickly. We need to be able to stick a stone in someone's shoe. Uh, we need to be able to say just two or three sentences at coffee break, at work, to, to, to garner some interest in what we have to say. Otherwise, the gospel is going to be drowned out in the sea of information. The church has an important role to play when it comes to truth. Paul wrote to Timothy that the church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth. Every local church has to be engaged in apologetics, in defending the faith in our secular environment. And that's what we want to, that's one of the things we want to stand for as a church here at Caversham. So here's the topics that we're going to be focused on in uh, January and February. We're going to start off with the cosmological argument today, next week. Ed will, will give us a message on the fine-tuning argument for God's existence. And you see the rest there. So you, we encourage you to keep coming back. What I'm going to share with you today is heavily influenced by J. Warner Wallace's God's Crime Scene book and video series. Um, he was a detective in Los Angeles County. 
And he, view, he tries to view the evidence as if uh, he were coming at it as a, as a detective, as an, a criminal investigator looking at the evidence. And, and he was an atheist, and by looking objectively at the evidence for God's existence and Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, he became a Christian. And now he's one of the most well-known apologists. And his, his book, I would just highly recommend it. It's great. And his, so the way he approaches is it is if, there's a, if you're coming to a crime scene, um, you put the yellow tape around it. And you don't let anyone tamper, come into the room and tamper with the evidence because you want to collect fingerprints, uh, you want to examine for dust, uh, drops of blood, all of the evidence, the DNA evidence. And so the question that a inv criminal investigator always asks is, it, can I explain the evidence or can I account for what I see in the room by staying in the room? Or... Is there some pieces of evidence that don't really fit the, the room inside? Is there evidence that someone came into the room from the outside and caused this crime to happen? And so he, you know, J. Warner Wallace, over the years, he, he did tons of these criminal investigations. He would appear in court, give testimony as a, as a police officer. And so then he, then he basically said, well, why can't we do the same thing? With the universe. I mean, sure, we don't see God, but we see a lot of evidence in the room. Can we explain, let's view our universe as a room, and can we explain everything we see in this room by staying in the room, by staying in the universe? Or are we, do we have to go beyond the universe to explain what we see in the universe? So that's kind of the strategy or the, the, the method that we're going to take with the cosmological argument. Now here, yeah, you see, this is the crime scene. Can you explain what's inside the room by staying in the room or do you have to go outside the room? Can everything we observe in the universe be explained by natural, physical causes and processes? If the answer is yes, then atheism is a pretty, pretty good answer. But if the answer is no, then you've got to look beyond atheism. It's not going to make the grade. Another way of asking the question is, is there any evidence inside the universe pointing to the existence or intervention of a supernatural being outside the universe? Now, there's lots of different pieces to look at. We are only going to talk about one of them, the cosmological argument. But you can see here, we're going to talk about this one. But there's a whole lot of other arguments we can use that come from outside the box that help explain everything we see inside the box. We're just, we're just scratching the surface with the cosmological argument. If we, if we had all year, we could go through all of these arguments. So I want you to just relax, okay? And let's get ready to think. Christians should be the best thinkers in the world. We are. I mean, we should be. We've got the best evidence. We've got the strongest worldview. Let's just get ready to think. Let's put our thinking caps on. I know it's January 3rd. It's a new year. We've been partying. We've been celebrating. We've been staying indoors because of the rain. We got flooded out at Henley, so we had to go the back way through Brighton. But, um, but let's think. It's good to think. God gave us a mind, right? Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Now, I want to say, too, your questions are invited. So probably afterwards, because i got a lot of slides, but definitely let, let us know your questions. So let's look at the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Again, it's just one of the many arguments we can use to get there. It's a cumulative case. Our case doesn't depend on just one of these arguments. But when you put them all together, then you, you have a strong, I'm telling you as your attorney, you have a strong case. I'm an attorney by trade, so I like to make an argument. So put all these, cumulative, it's a cumulative case for God's existence. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith, 
we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, I put in the word reasonable because in the Bible, faith is a reasonable faith built on evidence. What did, when Thomas said, show me the proof after Jesus' resurrection, what did Jesus do? Showed him the proof. Christianity is built off evidence. We're not fools. We believe in Christ because of the prophecies, because, because of Jesus' teachings, because of his life, death, and his resurrection. Because we know that this world couldn't have come the way it is by chance. Our, we can use common sense. And so our faith that God created the world out of nothing is a reasonable now, what is the cosmological, what, what does that mean? Well, you might hear out there Kalam cosmological argument or just cosmological argument. Same thing. In fact, there's a few different varieties of the cosmological argument, but we're going to focus on the Kalam cosmological argument. And cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which just means everything that exists. It's, it's the cosmos. If you remember, Carl, Carl Sagan in the 80s put out the video, Cosmos, or I think that was the name, Cosmos. So he was dealing in this area of why, why does this world exist? Where did it come from? So the cosmological argument focuses on the universe and why it's there. And so we as Christians are going to argue the, re the, the only reason it's there is that God put it there. There's no other reasonable explanation. That's really the heart of the cosmological argument. So, let's get to the argument itself. We have to have a premise, two premises, and the conclusion. And if they match, it's a logical argument. And here it is. This is what I want you to remember. Okay, Whatever begins to exist has a cause. You could say, whatever begins to exist must have. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. So this is, I would recommend you memorize this. Now we're going to go, to this morning, we're going to go beneath the surface and, and deal with each of those. But this is the one thing to remember. This is the one thing to share with your coworker um, over your lunch break. So the way to maybe approach this with your coworker is you could say something like, you know, did you know that science and evidence actually prove God exists? That might catch them off guard. And then you can say, yeah, there's, um, I could give you five, six, seven, even eight arguments uh, just from science and logic that show God exists. Can I share one of them with you? It's just called the cosmological argument. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause. And then you go beyond. You say, now, because the universe is space, time, matter, and energy, the cause of the universe must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and personal. Therefore, you've reached, what could that be? What, what fits the definition of spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and personal? Well, we have a three-letter word in English, if we dare say it, God. You, you will be, well, you probably won't be surprised how difficult it is for people to just admit that that is the most reasonable explanation for our universe. Now, if we were in this conversation, we could say something like, hey, I, uh, I can send you a video um, that can help better explain. So there's the, there's the uh, it's a video by uh, William Lane Craig. So you can use something on YouTube to kind of convince or you know, keep the discussion going with your coworker. And, and again, you can emphasize this is just one of many arguments 
hey, let's meet for coffee. Let's meet outside of work because you can't really talk too much about God at work, right? So let's have coffee over our lunch break, and then we can sit down and go into more detail. So back to the cosmological argument. That's the argument. Now, can we actually, is there, we're not going to go through all of the evidence with our coworker, right? But we want to have confidence that what we say to our coworker is true. Okay, so that's what we're going to spend the rest of our morning talking about. Let's focus first on the first premise. Remember, the first premise is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Which came first? Right? Which came first? Now, we don't have... Um, uh, Shawnee here, she works at a chicken farm, right? So she would like this picture. I was hoping she'd be here. But so we have a chick and we have an egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? So do things, let me just ask you, in your experience, do things just pop into existence? You're just walking down the street and pop, there's a tree all of a sudden. Or you're walking, you get home and you don't feel like making dinner and you just, and there it comes. There's your dinner. And it's, it's a gourmet meal. No. If any of you have seen something just pop into existence without a cause, let me know. Because I might have to send you somewhere. Right? No, I'm kidding. So, so if something can come from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? In fact, everyday experience... And scientific evidence both confirm that things don't just pop into existence. Everything that begins has a cause. Okay? Like, some of you have young children, so you know that they didn't just pop into existence. They have a cause. So, that's the first premise. And really, there's no debate among intellectuals on that first premise. Everyone agrees with that. It's the second one that there's more de a little bit more debate, but I'm going to show you that we have, we're on solid ground in that the universe began to exist. So we've est established the first premise. Let's look at the second premise. Did the universe begin to exist? And so here we have the question, think of the universe. Has it always existed like an eternal universe? There's really only two options. Is it eternal or did it have a beginning? If it's eternal, which is what scientists believe up until Einstein, really, then that's one thing. Then, okay, that, then the second premise wouldn't be true, and in the, it's a bad argument. But if it is proven that the universe had a beginning, then we know from the first premise it must have a cause. Okay? So this is the question. Did the universe begin or has it always existed? Now, you could just be like some... Now, these are all great philosophers of history. We have David Hume. We have... Who's a Scotsman, by the way. David Hume. We have Bertrand Russell and Stephen Hawking. And they all said, basically... This quote comes from Bertrand Russell... But they all have said in their various ways the, basic, the, the same thing. Quote, that the universe needs no explanation. It's just there. And that's all. Huh. Now we just said in the first premise that things just don't pop into existence. So why does the universe get a pass? I mean, it's the largest thing of all in, that we can observe, right? In fact, it doesn't get a pass. And so what these... What these atheists are basically doing are they're giving themselves a pass on the most on the biggest question of all. You see that? that? That's not fair, and it doesn't fly. And scientists, good scientists, really know that. The universe, just as we're coming into a crime scene and into a closed room. The, and we see evidence of an intruder, of someone outside the room coming in. In the same way, we can see that the universe had a beginning. Now, there's a cumulative case 
for the beginning of the universe. And that's, we're going to look at each one of these six areas to build that case that the universe had a beginning. Now, the first one is philosophical, so it's a bit harder to grasp, even, I mean, for me as well. But this is a philosophical problem. Now, would you agree with me that we, that we exist in time? That now exists? Would you agree that now exists? Okay, now exists. Now, the now is the finish line. Let's just say now is the finish line, okay? Now, if the universe had no beginning, if it's infinite into the past, then how would we ever get to now? You see that? Because the, the past is infinitely, it's going infinitely away from now. When would, when, would it, when would time start? This is the philosophical problem of infinite regression. In other words, philosophy says that there must be a point where time starts in order for now to be here. Okay? And another way of looking at is the calendar, you know? If the universe is infinitely old, infinite, which is never ending into the past, then it could never begin. Time really would be impossible. Now would not exist. Okay? So that's one piece of evidence. The problem of infinite regression. You can't have it. Otherwise, you can't have now. There must have been a beginning. Now, Again, I admit, that's a tough one. You have to think about that one a bit. But again, there's six. So that's just one. The second one comes from Mr. Einstein. And as I said before, prior to the 20th century, scientists believed that the universe was infinitely old. This was Newtonian physics. Sir Isaac Newton, who was a Christian, by the way. Um, he wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, actually. Yeah. Um, but that's, you can pay five cents in the offering plate for that one. Um, so pr prior to the 20th century, scientists agreed, hey, the universe is infinitely old. We don't need God. There's no creator, no creation, anything like that. But when Albert Einstein tried to apply his theory of general re relativity early in the 20th century to the cosmos, he discovered that the universe was not eternally old and unchanging. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures of some famous scientists. You tell me, ladies, which one is the best looking. Okay, so you have Albert Einstein here. Okay, now this next guy. Any, any takers there? This is Alexander Friedman, a Russian. And he took Einstein's theories in the 1920s, and he predicted that the universe was expanding. This blew people away and was totally unpopular with his contemporary scientists. Then next came along an American, Vesto Slipher. It's a nice name, eh? Vesto Slipher. And he discovered that if an object was moving toward Earth, its spectrograph color shifted toward blue. Is that right, Steve? Our, photo our night photographer. And then, if an object was moving away from Earth, it showed up as red. So, and he noticed that it was, they were all shifting red. And everything, everything was moving away from the Earth. Or most things, unless they would happen to be coming this way. But most things were shifting. So that meant that what... Uh, Einstein and Friedman had suggested theoretically was actually now being proved observationally through this red, through this red shift. And there you see it. There, if it's moving away, it's red, and that's what most things are happening. So that means that this, the universe is expanding. Stars and galaxies are getting further and further apart. Then comes Mr. Hubble. Edwin Hubble, another American, he proved that Slipher's nebulae, so they were getting better and better telescopes, and he showed 
that actually these nebulae were actually galaxies composed of billions of stars. This is when the, the real size of the universe began to, to be discovered. And, you know, the universe is so massive, as you, as you have heard. And so he, did, he, he further demonstrated that the speed at which a galaxy moves away from us is actually increasing. So not only are they moving away, the speed at which they're moving away from Earth is increasing. So what does that tell you? Well, that confirms that the universe is expanding. Next, we have a Belgian priest, George Lamarck, who in 1927 proposed that the, that the universe is expanding as an explanation for the red shift. And he concluded, going back, that there must have been a cosmic beginning where the expansion started. Okay, you see how we're getting to, remember, all of this has to do with, did the universe have a beginning? So that's the observational evidence. The next one is the funnest one, I think. And that's the second law of, second law of thermodynamics. The second law says that the quantity of energy in a closed isolated system remains the same, okay? So energy cannot be created or destroyed. I know you've heard that one in science class. But while that's true, the amount of usable energy is always decreasing over time. So unless fed from a source from the outside, the universe will all ultimately even out until it is entirely uniform in energy, temperature, and disorder. You know, if, uh, if you put on a boiling, if you boil the jug, what happens five minutes after you boil it? Or a after it reaches boiling point? It's colder, isn't it? Because energy is dispersed around the room. Same thing with the universe. The usable energy is used up. And so, the question there is, who wound up the universe? Or how did the universe get so wound up such that it's releasing this massive amount of energy, but then getting less and less over time? It must have had a beginning. If our universe was infinitely old, it would have run out of energy, usable energy by now. Then there's the abundance of helium, Sir Fred Hoyle. And he said, uh, or he, he believed in a stationary, eternal universe until he discovered that the amount of helium in the universe is totally out of proportion for, for what it should be. And helium, uh, to form helium, you must have dense, high temperatures and conditions for helium to form. And so the only explanation for the amount of helium in the universe is that there must have been a condensed point in time where helium uh, was created, and there's helium. So at the beginning, the, the Big Bang uh, theory has hydrogen and helium being the only two, uh, only two uh, elements that existed in, that first, in, in the first few seconds after the Big Bang. So then we have the cosmic background radiation. And here, this is Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. You see this is called the horn antenna. And this was, uh, forget, this was I think this was in the 40s or 50s. Um, but they discovered that wherever they turned their, this horn antenna, they, they had this background noise. And it didn't matter where in the sky they pointed it. And so they talked to their, their colleagues, and eventually they all came to the conclusion that it was this background radiation noise from an explosion many years in the past. Now, let's have a, let's have a break. That's a lot of information. I need uh, three, three volunteers. Three volunteers. Sophie, you always volunteer.
Uh, Asira, would you like to be an, a volunteer? No? Okay. Uh, okay, Sophie, any other volunteers? I need two more volunteers. Hello. 